go over to the client. All righty, ready to start. Let's get rid of these controls. All righty, it is 105, so we'll get started. So hello, everyone. My name is Amari. My name is Iman. I'm Lorelai. I'm Wendy. And welcome to our Back to Basics uh, nutrition webinar. And so today we're going to learn about the nutrient essentials your body needs to survive and feel good, uh, what happens if you don't meet those needs, and how do you know if you're meeting them, and also what if you're in sports. So I'll hand it off to Laura to start us off. Yes. So when we think about nutrition, we want to focus on the nutrients that our body needs to be fueled and to feel good. And so with that, we're going to talk about the macronutrients. And these are kind of the three essentials that we want to be incorporating into uh, all that we're eating. And so that includes carbs, fats, and protein. And so when we think about carbohydrates, that can be anything from fruits to veggies, milk, and honey. Uh, and then when we think about fats, that can be things like avocado, salmon, olives, oil, things like that. And then protein can be anything from meat and eggs. Uh, and then if you're vegan or vegetarian, that could be beans and tofu. All right. So the first one is going to be carbohydrates. And uh, maybe you've heard some things somewhere about carbs being bad, but really carbs are essential um, for our bodies to function optimally. And they provide our body's main source of energy. Uh, and they also fuel a lot of our major organs. And so we need a good balance of carbs within our uh, diet and the foods that we eat. And so that's a good balance of whole grains, starches, um, and also fruits and vegetables. And so there are a variety of different types of carbohydrate that includes starches, which are things like potatoes, um, fiber, which maybe you hear or know about from like dark leafy greens or whole grain bread, um, and then simple sugars, which can be found in things like baked goods or white flour, things like that. Um, and then starches are a form of a complex carb, um, and they can also be um, a part of legumes and starchy vegetables like potatoes and corn. Um, and then finally, another form of carbohydrate um, is in added sugar, sugar substitutes, or sweets. So as you can see, carbohydrates are in a lot of foods, and so it's really essential that we're getting them to have energy. The next category is protein, and protein is super important. Uh, for the process of muscle formation and also maintaining that muscle. But it's also really essential in order for us to have satiety and feel fullness. Uh, and this is important because we really want to enjoy and feel full when we are eating a meal. Um, and it's also really important for recovery and helping us to prevent injury. So maybe uh, you're someone who really enjoys working out, but even in just the day-to-day, -day, it's really important to support our muscles. And so when we think about protein, uh, we're thinking about amino acids and our bodies can make 11 out of the 20 needed amino acids. So we're going to have to get the other nine from the foods we eat. And so why, why protein? Why is this so important for us? When we combine protein with those other macronutrients, carbs and fats, we're able to create a really well-balanced meal and plate, which we'll show a little bit later. So when we think about protein, there are two different kinds, primarily. Um, the first being animal protein, and this maybe you're more familiar with. These are things like meat, fish, poultry, eggs, and dairy. Uh, but there's also plant protein, which we've seen grow a lot more popular over the years. And this is present in soy products, hemp seeds, um, and wheat products as well. The final macronutrient is going to be fats. Fats are essential for our cognitive function and our cardiovascular health, and also just make the meal overall more enjoyable. And so we have two different kinds of fats. We have the omega-3s. And so these are very good uh, for our heart, our brain, our mood, and our eyes. And these can be found in sources like fatty fish, seaweed, seeds, and nuts, a, a large variety of foods. Um, and then we also have omega-6s. These are very important because they have anti-inflammatory properties. Uh, and so they're great sources of them found in seed oils, uh, olive oil, avocado oil, oil, walnuts, tofu, and almonds. And so there's also a lot of different types of fat. Fat can be very controversial sometimes too, um, but it is, like I said, very important for us to be able to enjoy our meal and uh, have fullness. And so 
there's saturated fat, there's monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fat. So like oils or butter or cheese, uh, things like that. Uh, and lastly, when talking about balance of these oils, by adding a mix of omega-3s and omega-6s, we can feel satiated and enjoy our meal. So in addition to knowing those three, we can also combine them all uh, to really have a, a great and balanced meal. So here we've kind of created a pie chart to kind of explain it. Uh, so on the left side, you can see that carbs make up about 50%. Those are going to be your fruits and your veggies. Um, and then over here, you can see carbs in the form of whole grains and fiber. Uh, and then you have about 20% of that plate being made up of protein. And then fats are kind of sprinkled in there. And so when we're kind of eating a really well-balanced plate, we're able to um, honor our hunger cues and also reach fullness. Now, in addition to macronutrients, we also have micronutrients. Uh, and these are the essential vitamins and minerals that help our body to function optimally. Now, there are so many of them, but we've kind of focused on four main ones that we believe are really crucial uh, and kind of go alongside those macronutrients to help you um, to maintain a healthy um, lifestyle. So we're gonna be talking about calcium, vitamin D, potassium, and iron. So first is calcium. Maybe you've heard of this. Um, it's talked a lot about in regards to dairy, um, but calcium is an essential nutrient that is crucial for bone health uh, and bone development. And so it also is really important for circulation um, in the blood and our muscle. Um, and when we lack calcium, we will often have weaker bones and slow circulation. So it's very important and very crucial um, that we are getting enough calcium. So kind of the main sources of that are dairy, but it can also be found in some vegetables. Um, and like I said earlier, it's very important for bone and muscle health. The next micronutrient is vitamin D, also one that a lot of individuals are deficient in. And so it's an essential nutrient that our body itself cannot make. And so it is dissolved in those fats and oils that we talked about earlier. Um, and it also works alongside calcium. Um, and helps to support our cells. And so maybe you've heard about getting vitamin D from the sun, but we also need to be getting enough of that from the foods that we eat. And so we can find that within fish, eggs, and fortified cereals. Next, we have potassium. So potassium is a mineral and it's very important for kidney function, maintaining healthy blood pressure and bone density. So a whole slew of things. Um, and it is seen as an electrolyte, so it helps to really support um, those fluid levels as well. And it is related to sodium. Maybe you've heard a lot of talk about sodium, but potassium is just as important. And we can find that in a variety of different foods. One of the main ones uh, is bananas. Our last micronutrient is iron, uh, also one that a lot of individuals are deficient in. Maybe you know someone personally that is. It is essential for optimal health. Um, and so we need to get this mineral because it is used to make hemoglobin to carry oxygen throughout our whole body. So really important and it helps with energy and also physical performance. And so with that, it really has a lot to do with our blood and our immune function. And so how can we be getting more iron in our diet? We can consume uh, red meat. Um, and if you don't consume meat, then really focusing on those dark and leafy greens. So kind of takeaways, we really wanna prioritize getting all of the macronutrients and then coming alongside uh, with those micronutrients to best support uh, our health. And so to kind of further on this knowledge, Wendy is gonna come up and speak about what happens if we do not get these. Thank you, Lorelai. So, oh, next slide. <laughs> okay, so. I think we often hear about, um, you know, especially in like the fitness and health environment, like at the ARC, we hear about like foods that we should be eating less or cutting out, like such as like carbs, fats, um, because they're like bad for you. But really when restricting um, energy, it's not beneficial in the long term. Um, so I'll talk about what actually happens to us when we're cutting out food groups such as carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. And let's start off with carbohydrates. So 
I believe that we often hear how carbs are bad for us. Um, they make us feel bloated and things like that. Well, carbs are actually the main source of energy that our body uses, as Laura said. Um, it helps with like our brain, mainly runs on glucose and as well as our muscles. So when eliminating carbs from our diet will likely uh, lead to like water, fat, muscle loss, and you might feel fatigue. And that's probably from like, you're not getting enough energy. And so you're experiencing starvation. And this like, will also probably lead to you having increased cravings. And that will probably be due to like, you're in like a primal hunger mode. And so you're not able to control like what you're eating and how much you're eating. And so all these experiences are likely to happen when you're cutting out carbohydrates from your diet. And then now let's talk about protein. And I know protein might not be as much of a concern as we often hear, like we need to eat more protein and things like that, or like, um, but for those who are vegan and vegetarian, um, protein might be a concern. So I just want to cover uh, what happens to our body when we do not get enough protein. And so as Laura said, protein is, you know, part of like building and repairing tissues and muscles. So without protein um, in our diet, our hair, nails, skin, and organ, and these cell structures are likely to be affected. And the pH imbalance in our blood is like affected, which can affect like a whole body system of things. So like such as affecting the product production of enzymes and hormones, and as well as like regulatory functions such as immune system. So your immune system might not be like um, functioning properly to like help you with sickness and stuff like that. And then side. So fats um, may be a surprise to some that fats are actually functional and are involved in keeping our body healthy. And so it's essential for cell membrane health. And without fats, we're likely to experience decrease in hormone production. And most importantly, I think fats is like really important in terms of like fat soluble vitamins and how our body absorbs them and transport them. And some of these fat soluble vitamins are vitamin A, D, E, and K. And fats are also important in protecting our organs. So without them, our organs might be easily damaged if we were to get injured. And then lastly, for micronutrients, um, even though it doesn't provide us with energy or calories, I just want to cover that micronutrients are essential for supporting growth, brain development, immune function, and energy metabolism. So it's important to kind of like cover all these and have like a balanced diet so that we can keep our body in good shape. So what does this all mean? Um, the so it's a, the appropriate amount of macronutrients for each person, it'll vary based on your age, activity levels, your sex and other circumstances such as like stress and sleep and stuff like that, as well as like just your environment in general will really affect um, kind of like how many, how much you need to eat. And so eating a well-balanced diet with sources of each macronutrients is likely to meet your recommendation um, or recommended recommended intakes so it's not necessarily to kind of um, not necessary to count your macros and then just sum it all up and again like emphasizing that restricting energy intake might and probably is not beneficial for your overall long-term health and then Yuman's going to talk about sports nutrition Hi, um, let's talk about sports nutrition because we are right now in the ARC. So according to um, the GAs, the daily protein recommended intake for adults of 0.8 um, grams of protein per kilograms of weight per day. That's about 5.5 serving um, for like whole day. And 
the palm of your hands is about three to four ounces of meat, just for reference. If you want to build muscle, um, then for strength and power athletes, it's about 1.4 to 1.8 grams of protein per day. No, per kilograms of body weight per day. And if you are an uh, endurance athlete, then it's going to be 1.2 to 1.4 grams per kilograms of body weight. I know numbers are all exhausting. So here is a, a bath meal. You can see the protein is about a quarter of your plate for each meal. And people will always ask me about like, what should we eat before and after workouts? So protein are recommended before the workouts to help but uh, muscle thinnesses and after the workout, we will follow the four R's principle. The first one is rehydration. So drink uh, plenty amount of water, uh, maybe with sodium um, if you sweat a lot. The second one is refill. So eat a lot of, maybe not a lot, but a good amount of carbs and proteins after the workout to help uh, with muscle thinnesses. The third one is repair. So your body and your muscle needs proteins to build itself. And some supplements may be rec recommended. Uh, we will talk about those later. The last one is rest. So to keep in mind, um, keep um, enough of sleep hours. Um, before we dive into the supplements, supplementations uh, we do not usually recommend those because um, they're kind of expensive so in this webinar we will tell you guys how to get enough like those supplements with natural whole foods the first one is bcaa um, the full term is called brands chain amino acids which includes uh leucine as a leucine and alanine Research shows they may help reduce exercise fatigue and help muscle soreness after workout, and it may also help build uh, muscle. How do you get BCAAs from whole food? So usually high protein foods like beef, pork, fish, and eggs are high in BCAA. If you are a vegetarian, then you could go for nuts, seeds, beans, and legumes. Um, Dairy is also rich in BCAAs. The second one is creatine. It's a substance that found naturally in human body. So we naturally produce them. Research shows it may uh, help produce energy during weightlifting and increase muscle mass, help increase power and strength. Um, also, like meats contains a lot of proteins like beef, poultry, and fish. The last one is caffeine. We all know we all know about it. Uh, it's a stimulant that absorb into our blood, and you remain the concentration remains high for three to four hours. Some people have benefits effects like enhance it can enhance endurance and long duration activity performances and it can it may help release store fat from your body however some people may face some side effects like anxiety dizziness and stomach discomfort so if you're those type of people just maybe avoid caffeine um, you can get caffeine from coffee tea chocolate and cola Lastly, we're going to talk about some uh, activities. So according to dietary guidelines for Americans, they recommend adults to take like 150 to 300 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic activity each week, which includes brisk walking, biking, hiking, basketball, soccer, and tennis. They also recommend some muscle strength activity at least two days per week. But they didn't specify like exact amount time um for everybody. So um which exercise fits in your schedule is the like the best exercise for you. And for people who just started it, please 
increase the intensity gradually to avoid an, any injuries. And the most important thing is to enjoy the like the movement you make. Um, next, we're gonna dive into intu intuitive eating. All righty, so now that we've talked about uh, normal nutrient needs and also nutrient needs for when you're in sports or doing activity, now we're gonna talk about how do we know when we're hungry or how do we know when we're full? So that's when intuitive eating comes to play. So before we talk about intuitive eating, we'll start from the beginning. And in the beginning, I mean as babies. So as babies, we ate intuitively. When we were hungry, we'd cry out for our mom. And when we were, and when we were full, we would, stop, we would stop eating and start playing with our food. But as we've gotten older, we've started to ignore these hunger cues. Hunger cues, if you don't know about them, they are feelings or emotions that are tied to the feeling of hunger and satiety, satiety being the feeling of fullness. So societal pressures like social media, fad diets, have given us a set of body ideals that have caused us to change the way that we look at ourselves. And this is called diet culture. Because of diet culture, we now no longer intuitively eat in order to achieve this ideal look or body type that the media has given us. So what is diet culture? Diet culture is a set of cultural myths around food, weight, and health. You may have seen or experienced it with your friends or family. It could be examples like, I need to lose weight in order to fit into this dress, or I'm gonna cut out carbs so that I can lose weight. These are all ways of thinking that focuses on thinness as an ideal. Uh, the media has dictated what behaviors we must follow and foods to eat in order to be thin. This then causes people to label foods as good or bad. Um, you may have heard in the media that foods that are high in fat or sugar are bad and foods that are good are those that are vegetables and whole grains. When in reality, there are no good or bad foods. All of this way of thinking can cause a decline in our mental health and also cause um, even disordered eating as these unrealistic expectations cause us to change the way we see ourselves and changes the way we eat. So we wanna break away from this diet culture. And to do that, uh, one way to do that is with intuitive eating. So what is intuitive eating? So intuitive eating is a non-diet approach to eating. This means rejecting rules and restrictions when eating and instead listening to those cues that your body gives you. Intuitive eating also means um, allowing yourself to enjoy foods without any judgment. There are 10 principles uh, to intuitive eating. All are meant to help you honor your body cues and achieve a way of thinking that is more forgiving when it comes to food. So like I said, there are 10 principles to intuitive eating that are meant to help you honor these body cues and also rediscover the pleasure of eating. But for today, we're just gonna focus on the first two um, principles. So the first principle of intuitive eating is to reject the diet mentality. This means throwing out any books or ideas of diet culture and to not let it linger. Uh, this can take time since diet culture is very deeply embedded into us and also everywhere with social media being very popular. Um, but slowly, uh, you can let go of these ideals, uh, and it can help you let go of these unrealistic expectations for yourself and also develop a stronger sense of self-compassion. And this can allow yourself, um, this allows yourself to eat without feeling bad or judging yourself uh, based on how you look, based on how you eat. The second principle is meant is to honor your hunger. Uh, this means keeping your body biologically fed. Your body is, an amaz is amazing in that it can tell you what it wants and when it needs it and you need to body, uh, fuel your body when it needs it. Um, if you don't, you'll reach a state called primal hunger, which you don't, where you don't have control over what you're eating and will want to eat anything around you. And to avoid, ooh, to avoid that um, would be to honor your first signal of hunger. So like I said before, hunger and satiety cues are emotions and feelings that are tied to the feelings of hunger and satiety. Like, how do you know when you're hungry? It could be something like having a rumbling stomach or having continuous thoughts of food. And how do you know when you're full? So you may be asking, how do we recognize these cues in ourselves? Well, for hunger, you could use something called a hunger scale. This is a scale from one to 10, with one being ravenously hungry and 10 being very uncomfortably full. Uh, and it can help you recognize your hunger level, your appetite, and maybe why you're feeling this hungry at this point in time. And you're welcome to take a picture or a screenshot of the hunger scale if you'd like to explore it more. Okay. All right. 
Same goes with the satiety cues. You can use the satiety cue descriptor to help describe when you're feeling full. Um, it can be characteristics like you stop thinking about food or you're feeling happier. I know I feel happier when I'm full. But what are the first steps to intuitive eating? Like, how do we do this? Well, it starts with listening to the cues that your body gives you. Don't ignore them for the sake of wanting to look a certain way. Give your body the energy it needs at the first sign of hunger. You should also give yourself unconditional permission to eat food with attunement to your body cues. This means not labeling certain foods as good or bad and allowing yourself to eat a food without any judgment or rules. You should also allow yourself to enjoy these foods. When you do, uh, you obsess less about these foods and these cravings you have for them decrease, allowing you to enjoy these foods normally. You can also use a hunger scale, which can help you assess how hungry or full you are when you're eating and af uh, after you're eating or before you're eating. Um, and one more thing, it takes practice and time to uh, start intuitively eating and let go of these diet rules. Uh, but progress is not a straight line. Give yourself time to learn about it and adjust to this way of eating and eventually you can succeed. Intuitive eating is a way of eating that is in tune with your body cues and listening to your body cues and when your body eats food. So some additional resources we have if you're interested in intuitive eating, we have some books and some websites you could check out if you're interested in starting or learning more about intuitive eating. If you'd like to take some pictures, go ahead of the books. And then we also have an intuitive eating student support group um, that where you meet with a group of other students who are interested in intuitive eating and you go through the 10 principles and talk about intuitive eating. It's meant to be a safe space to talk about intuitive eating. And if you'd like to be part of this group, you're welcome to email Lisa. Her email is up on the board. And we also have a QR code for you to scan if you'd like to register. They are on rolling registration, so you can register throughout the year and they'll email you when they have available cohorts to see if you can join, if you are available to join. Alrighty, thank you so much for listening to our webinar today. Our emails are up on the screen. Feel free to email us if you have any questions about what we talked about today after the webinar. Um, welcome to take a picture of our emails as well. And then we also have a list of resources that you are welcome to check out and do more research if you wanna learn about the things we talked about. Thank you so much. Any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. We'll be here for a couple more minutes to answer questions if you have any. Stop recording. Okay, I'm gonna stop recording. Stop recording. Stop recording.